This video is by Straight Goods News. The commissioner is concerned that environmental protections are not keeping pace with economic development. He talked about a resource boom. What we hope is that we don't see an environmental bust or, by extension, an economic bust. Natural resources need to be developed in a way that meet robust environmental standards and consumer expectations of those standards in foreign markets or we risk losing those markets. It can't be stressed enough that good environmental protection makes good economic long-term sense because it prevents the costly impact of rushed development on our environment, which Canadians and future generations and our future economy will bear the burden. The theme of this report is that time and time again the government is either ignoring or is willfully blind to risk because of their ideologically driven inaction. For example, healthy marine ecosystems are essential in ensuring the long-term sustainability of a billion dollar uh, uh, fisheries and ecotourism industry. They're good for the economy, but all of that is being put at risk by slow action from the government on establishing and protecting marine areas. Marine areas that are already under threat from the effects of climate change and pollution. Canada's fisheries have seen a 40% reduction in yield relative to the late 1980s. This must be halted. Throughout the report are too many examples of the government not fulfilling its obligations to protect us from risk. With respect to financial assurances, the government doesn't know if the assurances that are in place are sufficient. They don't know. They simply don't know. For nuclear and offshore oil and gas, Canada has outdated liability limits for damages to third parties. These are limits that are, le are billions less than in other countries, and they haven't been changed in over two decades. This is leaving taxpayers on the hook, and it fails the, to meet the test of prudent financial management. We know that from past experience and past reports that caps on liability encourages risky behavior. Environmental damage just becomes another budget line item. We need a liability regime that discourages project proponents from cutting costs and that encourages good planning so that our environment and our economy are protected. We only have one chance to get development right. The Commissioner's finding on Atlantic offshore oil underline the risk to our environment and our economy. There are major gaps in response planning and in capabilities. Systemic tracking measures are not in place and the CNLOPB has yet to finish a review of operator equipment and resources. This puts huge risks to our fisheries and tourism and it also damages our international reputation. Who would buy oil from a country that was such a risk taker? Poor regulations make this development seemingly pointless. Poor financial management is the theme of this report and another example of how the government is failing taxpayers is with regards to oil and gas subsidies. First of all, the very fact that we have these profitable companies being subsidized is problematic. And even worse, Finance Canada was unable to give the Commissioner the complete numbers on what these tax expenditures are actually costing Canadians. How can our government not know what the cost of these subsidies amount to? And it bears repeating that the hundreds of millions of dollars per year on subsidies does not include the value of advocacy, promotion or outreach that's being performed around the world by Canadian government, by the Canadian government on behalf of their oil industry buddies. Given that the government made the promise in 2009 to our G20 partners that we would eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, the Commissioner's report today should have been an announcement that the government has achieved this goal. The Environment Commissioner will appear at uh, Natural Resources Committee today. Um, we don't find this to be an acceptable, um, out, uh, an acceptable venue for the Environment Commissioner for this report and uh, we'll be bringing forward a motion to, uh, tomorrow at Environment Committee to ensure that he is able to address uh, his report at the Environment Committee as well. I don't know that we have an actual position. Uh, certainly we've been looking at the research that says there should be unlimited liability. Um, that's the standard in some other, um, in some other countries. Um, I think that this report sheds light on the fact that we, we don't have an adequate system in place and I think there needs to be quite a bit of work done uh, to figure out where that liability should lie. And, and, and given this gap between um, the legislation we have now and the boom in, in the resource projects, I mean other than 
increasing uh, environmental legislation. What else should be done in the meantime? Should we put a freeze on major uh, new resource projects until we have that legislation in place? I think that's a really important question to be asking right now. I think we should all be asking ourselves that question. Um, this report came out this morning. We are going to have to look at it in detail, um, but we also need to look at it when we layer the changes to the Environmental Assessment Act, the changes in Bill C-38 and the changes in Bill C-45, uh, C we have to layer those on top of this report. Uh, this report was put, was put together before those changes in the omnibus budget actually went through. And as you saw in the Environment Commissioner's report, um, the CNOPB and the Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board, they don't even understand how those changes are going to impact them as boards. Um, so I think we need a little more time with the report. I think we need a little more time um, to think about what will the implications of the omnibus budget bill on these be on these boards. Um, and I would think we need to come up with a plan. Margot McDermott, CBC Television. Um, Megan, uh, this question is for you. Were you surprised at the total that uh, Scott Vaughn came up with for the overall um, support in terms of uh, direct money to the oil and gas industry for research and the mm. tax, various tax breaks? If you add them all up, officials say it actually comes to $4 billion mm. over five years. Did that surprise you? I think the numbers, I'm going to give a little bit of the same answer as before where I say, you know, this did come out this morning and uh, we do have to take a look at those numbers. They're different than some other numbers that we've seen coming from some other bodies. Um, but I think it is, the most important thing is these subsidies continue and the Environment Commissioner himself said it was really hard to get the numbers to actually do the audit. Uh, I don't believe he made any allusions to the fact that numbers or, or information was being hidden. Uh, but the very fact that Finance Canada can't produce numbers for us can't can't actually give us uh, any kind of analysis on where these subsidies are and how much they amount to is really hard to believe. Uh, so we'll take a little bit of time with what the Environment Commissioner has produced and compare it to some of the other reports that have come out in, in the past couple of years. And, and just a quick follow-up, mm -hmm. though, I mean, the, the government says, I mean, they are phasing them out. So does that kind of reassure you in some ways that we're getting rid of them? The government says a lot of things when it comes to environment, but their follow-through is pretty lax. Uh, we really should be here today Day, celebrating the fact that these subsidies are gone, not the fact that they're they're still remaining, and we actually don't have a proper accounting of them. Pulls from companies to cover the cost is sufficient. I'm wondering what your reaction is to that, um, not just from a financial perspective, but from the perspective of the communities that live up there, and, and for Aboriginal communities in particular. You're right. Seventy percent of the inspections weren't done, and. Uh, it <laughs> 70% of, of site visits weren't done. It's really incredible to think um, that this is happening, uh, that our government's just letting these uh, these in, um, inspections go by. If I were living in a northern community, I would be very concerned about what is going on in these sites. Do Are there the liability uh, coverages that we need? Are the assurances that we need? Um, but I have to say, if I were living on the east coast of Canada, I would be concerned uh, about what is happening when it comes to offshore drilling. Are we adequately protected? If I were living in a province that did, um, that performed hydraulic fracturing, I'd be concerned about what are these chemicals that are being put into the ground. There is a profound lack of information here, a lack of coordination of that information, and a profound lack of follow through by this, by this government. And I'm just wondering, you, you talked about the ideologically driven agenda of the government in light of the fact that environmental protections, according to the Commissioner, are not keeping up pace with development. Can you elaborate on, on what you believe that ideological uh, slant is? And you know, would you say that some of these protections are being scaled back to allow for resource development to occur? Well, we have seen time and time again uh, this government actually cater their uh, regulation changes or their legislative changes to the oil and gas industry while shutting out uh, the concerns of environmental organizations and the concerns of, of just regular communities across Canada, uh, shutting out their concerns. I was very careful to say ideologically driven inaction. Uh, the changes for example, to SIA, the Environmental Assessment Act in, in Bill C-38, uh, that was ideologically driven action, actually changing the legislation to ensure that, um, you know, unbridled, unfettered resource development goes goes through at any cost. This is actually, this report, we're actually seeing that ideologically driven inaction, a failure to keep up the pace of the environmental legislation along with the pace of uh, 
of legislation around resource extraction. Um, th this is, I think no one can say it as clear or no one can say it better than the Environment Commissioner when he said there just there is a gap here between what we're doing on the resource front and where our legislation, where our environmental protections are. Um, I think he summed it up perfectly. Interest and also to the public's um, kind of lack of understanding of what the economic benefits could be of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, so that's obviously not just a temporary oversight, it's a much bigger problem. Um, what do you think could be done, say, in Atlantic Canada to get us to where Australia is or California is? I mean... Hmm. Um, well, I think you hit the nail on the head in how you described it as a lack of political will. I mean, we know we know how to do this. Other countries are doing it. It's not um, it's not complicated. Um, so so what needs to be done? We need to actually say, all right, let's go. Let's have a plan. Let's start actually creating marine protected areas. Um, we are so uh, woefully behind our goals. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the um, Canadian Parks and Wilderness uh, Association (CPAWS) actually put forward a report. And, and basically said the same thing that the Environment Commissioner is saying now, where we are very far behind what our commitments are, and we're also very far behind what other countries are doing. Um, and, and they lay out a plan for how we can get there, and it's basically to act. It's, it, I know it's um, not a very uh, sexy answer, but that's, that's what we need to do. We actually just need to put this plan in place. Um, all, of the, all of the framework is there, right? We've signed international biodiversity conventions. We know how to do this. Um, the most concerning, I think it might depend where you live. <laughs> um, I think the liability issue is, is for me, probably the most concerning. Um, the very fact that if we're not prepared for a spill, uh, the liability caps are far too low. That encourages risky behavior. And um, and furthermore, we don't actually know who's in charge uh, if, if something were to happen. We saw in the U.S. after the Enbridge uh, Kalamazoo spill, um, the decision coming out saying that Enbridge, it was like the Keystone Cops. Well, I'm quite worried that if there were a spill uh, off the shores of Atlantic Canada, we'd have another situation of Keystone Stone cops. Who's in charge? Is it uh, the CNOPB? Is it Nova Scotia? Is it the feds? Uh, we just don't know.